Hello and welcome back to the Nasty Metal Production Grid YouTube and welcome to another album of the week. This is episode number 173 and today's episode is a spotlight on Corridors of Power, the official second album from Gary Moore. Now, it is his second official album, okay? It's his second. And you can't... Uh, and. Unless you really want to say it's his official third record, that means if you count Grinding Stone, the album that, that released in 1973, that was under the Gary Moore Band, okay? The Gary Moore Band. We don't consider the, the albums from Pity Is For You up to Muscle of Love as just Alice Cooper we consider those albums as the Alice Cooper band, even though they bear the name Alice Cooper, but technically it was actually the name for the band, not for the solo artists, because Alice Cooper hadn't yet really, really ended up changing his name officially, like, I mean, uh, documentally, you know, to Alice Cooper from Vincent Furnier. He was, he was using it as a stage name, but he eventually, by the time after Muscle of Love, he eventually pretty much changed his uh, his entire name to Alice Cooper. So we don't consider those records as just Alice Cooper. They're not really part of his actual solo, uh, you know, discography. So in a way... I think we're best left to not consider Grinding Stone as part of Gary Moore's actual solo stuff. So, some might, you might, you might as well if you, if you feel like it. But in this case, I think it's best that we don't. So, that's the Gary Moore Band. This is released under Gary Moore for the artist. So, this is his first official solo record. I know... Grinding Stone at times is considered a solo record, but again, it bears the name of the Gary Moore Band. So there we go. Okay, just wanted to get that out of the way. All right, so where do I really begin? I'm going to try and do my best to make this more bullet point because of the history for Gary Moore has already been telltaled in, in like, uh, you know, biography books and documentaries and everything else, you know, the history of Gary Moore. So if you want to read a detailed history about Gary Moore or or hear about or watch it, whatever, there's probably plenty of other mediums out there. You can read on like either uh, on different sites and everything. There should be, there's, his, his history is out there. So I'm just going to go through bullet points. So for Gary Moore... I'm just going to read a little bit of this because after moving to Dublin, Moore, of course, joined the Irish blues rock band Skid Row. At the time, the group was fronted by Phil Lynott, who I think kind of put Thin Lizzy on hold because of he, uh, Thin Lizzy was at least formed in 1969. I think. Yeah. Um, but in a way, he kind of seemed like he put that band on hold and... Again, I mean, uh, Brian Downey and Phil Lynott were obviously with Thin Lizzy, but it's, you know, he put Thin Lizzy on hold to uh, front Skid Row. Again, this is not the same Skid Row as one we know now. You know, the one with like Dave, you know, Dave the Snake Sabo and Skid, you know, uh, Sebastian Bach. Okay, it's not the same band. This is the Irish Skid Row. So Gary Moore ends up uh, pretty much joining this, you know, joining. Um, Skid Row. However, after a medical leave of absence, Lynott was asked to leave Skid Row by the band's bassist, Brush Shields, so who had taken over lead vocal duties. So eventually, it's just now Gary Moore is pretty much now mostly associated, and so that pretty much leads into the very first record, and um, that would have been, I believe, in 1970. Uh, or was it by 1971, actually? It would have been 19... Uh, maybe, I don't know. <laughs> but again, so... Well, pretty much for, for the most of the early career of Gary Moore, he's with Skid Row, but I think after... I think either the... Let me look at this real quick, uh, just to kind of keep up a bit. 
Got the albums here. Uh, yeah, I guess after 1971, um, technically, I guess that uh, things don't go the way that they should. And eventually, Gary Moore pretty much uh, ends up, I guess, he, what, he, he had become frustrated by Skid Row's uh, limitations, opting to start a solo career, which, again, leading into the Gary Moore band. And so eventually he kind of starts up the Gary Moore band that released Grinding Stone. And I guess things don't just don't go the way that they do as well with that one. So after I think he was probably just being used as a hired gun until eventually he ends up befriending again Phil Lynott and... Uh, Again, Brian Downey, and that's where we lead into what would actually would be considered his first real solo record. Because again, the fact that Grinding Stone bears the band name of the Gary Moore band and not just Gary Moore as in the solo artist, but even though Gary Moore probably would cite Grinding Stone as uh, his his uh, first solo record, it's just that it's just it's credited as the Gary Moore band. And so with Back on the Streets, he pretty much releases this record just under Gary Moore. And so the lineup, of course, for this one is probably much different from the, the lineup that he recorded for, you know, on the Grinding Stone album. So besides uh, Phil Linett and Brian Downey, of course, appearing on the record, and that's, of course, it's including a... Uh, a more of a different worked version of Don't Believe a Word. We also have Don Airy, which eventually he would keep for a bit there. And I'll get into that. Uh, John Mole on bass. Of course, Simon Phillips, who, which Simon Phillips uh, is best known for, of course, uh, for working with Judas Priest on the classic Sin After Sin record. And, of course, then uh, joining, you know, the Michael Schenker group. In 1980, which again, Don Airy also would work with as well in that same year. And uh, Don Airy would go on to work with plenty of other artists as well, which I'll get into as well. Uh, but so, and of course, uh, Chris Sangerides uh, producing the album. Again, the late uh, Chris Sangerides producing uh, the Back on the Streets record. And pretty much that album was released on September 30th of 1978 through MCA, the European and Japan market. And then, of course, Jet Records in the United States. Possibly in Canada as well. Maybe. So there's at least that. And then after the Back on the Streets record, I think he pretty much he pretty much puts the entire solo uh, project thing on hold again in favor of this time actually joining uh, Thin Lizzy. So this might have been the beginning of that sort of leaning. And that, of course, goes into 1979's Black Rose of Rock Legend. And so that's pretty much what we get in 1979, and that's a great record. It's actually, that's pretty much how I think even for everybody was in a way was more exposed to Gary Moore, because uh, I don't know how many people uh, would have at least picked up Gary Moore's stuff uh, prior you know, in the U.S. They probably that I mean people probably picked it up, but they didn't really know whether or not that was. They probably did knowing that Phil Lynott and uh, Brian Downey were going to be on it. But for me, growing up, since having, you know what, that dedication uh, compilation disc, which had some songs, you know, off the Black Rose of Rock Legend record, that was my exposure to Gary Moore. But the thing is, I didn't really know who the fuck Gary Moore was until several years in into my life. You know, I wouldn't really know who he was. But again, I would hear the songs, I would hear this guitar playing. And so it's like, I didn't really put it together. And I probably would see his name on there. As I said, I just wasn't really smart enough to who he really was. You know, so again, there it is. That's pretty much ends up being it for Gary Moore and Thin Lizzy. And from the stories I have heard is that Gary Moore, the reason why he didn't really stick too much around with Phil Linett and Brian Downey, uh, especially in like Thin Lizzy, is because of as much as he considered him a good friend, at the same time, he wasn't very much a supporter of... The substance abuse, mostly like the drug use and just all the excessive partying. There's just some of that stuff he just didn't like from what I've heard. And, and so it just made it difficult for him to actually, you know, be around uh, the guys in Thin Lizzy. So that's why I pretty much ended up breaking off from Thin Lizzy and pretty much re going back to being solo. However, at, at the same time, he was also starting up another band called G-Force. 
Uh, now, from what I've heard is that Moore suddenly quit the band to, and moved to Los Angeles, hoping to establish a, a solo rock presence with the opportunity to tour American support of Van Halen. Moore recruited his one-time Thin Lizzy band bandmate, uh, drummer Mark Nassif, again, who was also an elf in the Angillan band. And then, of course, vocalist, bassist, uh, you know, Glenn Hughes. Uh, then dubbing the band G-Force. Several months into rehearsals, Hughes left the band uh, after an alcohol feud altercation with Moore and was replaced with uh, vocalist Willie D. Uh, uh, actually born William Daffern, formerly of Captain Beyond. Now, I believe that would be... Because I just talked about Captain Beyond anyways, because I actually covered the, the self-titled debut album and uh, you know from 1972. I believe uh, William Daffern is the one, if I remember correctly, from that video. And again, I own the record. He only sang on Dawn Explosion, which is actually considered... Depending on you ask, it's either looked as the weakest Captain Beyond am, or to some people, probably the second best after the uh, the self-titled debut. So going from Glenn Hughes to William Daffern is kind of interesting in a way. It, it is. However, I doubt that the G-Force record is going to come any sort of, it's going to close to uh, what Dawn Explosion was because I think that's a really great record. And I think it's the sound-wise it's going to pale in comparison because it's different. So... There he gets William Daffern and, of course, Tony Newton and Mark Nassif. Again, uh, he was getting those. And that's, of course, what have been produced uh, actually by almost pretty much most of the guys in G-Force. And that was also uh, going to be the first record was going to be released by Jet. But at the same time, he's also working on a record called Dirty Fingers. Uh, and so I lost the fucking page. Here we go. I think there we go. Now... The difference here is that he's working on two different records. He's working on the G-Force, but he's also here working on Dirty Fingers, which, again, would have been his... Technically, at this point, this actually would have been seen as two people as a second official full-length record. However, I'll get into why it's not seen as the second Gary Moore solo record. Why it's not. Or in his eyes, probably the third. But... After, you know, joining Finn Lizzy, he pretty much had disbanded what was pretty much most of what was that lineup for the Back on the Street Sam. So he didn't keep one of those guys, but he kept Don Airy from the Back on the Streets record. And at this point, Don Airy was also doing stuff with, uh, at this point, working with Ozzy Osbourne. And he was also even uh, even working with Michael Schenker on the Michael Schenker Group record. Eventually, he also get used by Richie Blackmore for, like, what difficult to cure and stuff. Which, probably because of, based on that, that connection with Richie Blockmore and, uh, uh, was it, uh, god dang it, uh, Roger Glover lost a train of thought there. Probably because of those, those connections, why he ended up uh, being seen as the, uh, or looked as the possible good, you know, um, uh, exceptional, or the, uh, what's the, uh, the, the, I guess the, the right, uh, you know, I guess, replacement for John Lord and Deep Purple is what I'm getting at. Okay, I guess the one that just made more sense because of he they been around him and uh, he was obviously hired by pretty much most everybody every freaking band in the world, which we'll get to to at least uh, the drummer on the Dirty Fingers record. But after that, we also got Jimmy Bain, who at this point was not being used much because of he was kicked out of uh, Rainbow, obviously, just like with Ronnie James Dio and some of the other guys. It's like he also did with. After what the first record, because pretty much most of the first uh, Rainbow album was all of Elf, just minus uh, David Rock Feinstein, who again, the Rods. Uh, but again, Jimmy Bain ended up uh, pretty much uh, being a part of Rainbow Rising and um, uh, Long Live Rock and Roll. And then he was pretty much just along with like um, Co Cozy Powell and Ronnie James Dio. He's out of the band. And so he's pretty much kind of left uh, being just a hired musician. And so Gary Moore uses him for this record. Same goes for Tommy Aldridge, who probably was just coming off the heels of the Pat Travers band, even though Tommy Aldridge first started, first got his start in Black Oak, Arkansas. But he's just coming off the heels of Pat Travers, which again, which would have been for the Crash and Burn record, which is notorious for the song Snortin' Whiskey. There we go. 
But eventually, though, Tommy Audrey's, you know, he would get be used for, like, what Ozzy Osbourne just a year later uh, for the Die of a Madman tour, what, replacing Lee Kerslick. And then eventually, uh, these days, he's with uh, White Snake. So he's been, he's, and then what, uh, got used by Motorhead for a bit for the March or Die record, uh, which uh, is being used as a, tra as a transitional drummer from um, uh, Phil Taylor to, of course, Mickey D. You know, of course, these days, Mickey D is in Scorpions. So there you go. I know, a lot of facts getting brought up. But there you go. And, of course, Charlie Hun is the vocalist on the record. Now, Charlie Hun, I think, at this point, is still contrary, contractually obligated to Ted Nugent. Which, again, uh, for the Scream Dream record, then, of course, after that, he'd be gone. And then, of course, he's working with uh, Gary Moore on here. And, obviously, for many reasons why he would leave that fucking asshole... And then he pretty much now would eventually go on to be a part of the German hard rock slash metal band Victory. So, and of course, even later on, even uh, being in Foghat. There you go. But so he's got Charlie Hunt, Don Airy, Jimmy Bain, and Tommy Aldridge with, of course, Chris Sangerides producing the record. And this would be the final record that uh, Gary Moore would use, you know, Chris Sangerides to produce. Because he was also working with Ties of Pantang and... Uh, just a year later, we'd also work with uh, Anvil and then uh, work on all the stuff with uh, Y&T. And I mean, he got his start, though, being an engineer for Judas Priest on the Saturdays of Destiny record. But he would then work with uh, Judas Priest again for the Painkiller album. So there you go. All these bullshit facts. But that's just all just the, the, the level of history just with these guys in the back uh, the bands that they had been with prior to, uh, you know, work that stuff with Gary Moore. So, he pretty much records all of Dirty Fingers, but the thing is, he doesn't release the Dirty Fingers records. He what instead he favors the G-Force record. Now, it's not like that he's favoring Jet Records um, ideals. It's not that he's favoring them in a way he could have been. But there's I'm going to read you a quote though, and it actually kind of makes sense why I think uh, Gary Moore was actually the one that shelved the Dirty Fingers records record so i'll read you this quote here this is what what he at least says about the dirty fingers records and why he shelved it so this is what he said i was pleased with the songs on it but i would like to have at least finished the mixes before uh, letting people hear it so he just was not a fan of the mixes he liked the production and he just wasn't, just at the mixes, he wish have had more time work on it. Because of, I think, I, I can actually can believe that, and I can understand that, because of, he's working on two albums simultaneously in a way. He's working on two records. It's just that he put more, probably more faith into the G-Force record than he probably did into Dirty Fingers. And so, in a way, since you're probably, are kind of, he's juggling with two heavy bricks there, in a way, probably one heavy, one light. He's probably thinking, you know what? I'm probably going to have more uh, weight with the lighter one than, let's say, the heavyweight one. I'm sorry. I'm considering the Dirty Fingers ones be the heavyweight one. Because I think it was, and, and as much as he probably thought the G-Force record was going to be good, I think he probably kind of, kind of uh, lucked out. Because I actually think Dirty Fingers was probably the stronger record of the two. Just that he put more effort into the G-Force one than Dirty Fingers. So... He could have released both records on the same year if he had more time to work on it, but he probably put so much faith, but it seemed like that one didn't, it blow over since uh, things didn't go well with him and um, Glenn Hughes. It just, everything went complete shit, I think, afterwards. Just, I think, crazy that compared to the two, this one was probably the best one he should have. I wish he should have worked more on it because if he's actually got the better lineup for, the, for this record, for Dirty Fingers. But... Eventually, Dirty Fingers does get released on April 21st of 1983. So, just pretty much three years later, ends up getting released. Of course, through Jet Records. And again, it's a much more raw sounding album, even given the fact that it's produced by Chris Singerides, who had also produced Back on the Streets, but it's just a little bit raw. I guess it might be due to the fact that how poorly it was mixed, but it was probably just sound like a rough mix of the album, but they just went with it instead of putting more time and actually really fixing out the traits. But honestly, I think it's actually one of the best records I think Gary Morris released. Actually, I think it's probably better than the one I'm going to be talking about, that being Corridors of Power. So... 
with the fact that Dirty Fingers didn't get officially released in 1980. Therefore, it was not going to be considered his second record, even though it was recorded second after the Back on the Streets record. But that's where he ended up leading into Corridors of Power. So he pretty much, for what would become Corridors of Power, since he would ink a, a deal with Virgin Records, instead of going on with the same, because at this point, Jimmy Bain uh, is probably uh, going to work with Ronnie James Dio again. And of course, Tommy Aldridge has gone to probably work with someone else. And Charlie Hunn is still someone maybe kind of working with Ted Nugent still. And Don Airy is off to working with, uh, it was still uh, uh, Rainbow and everything. He's off to working with, with other different bands now. Everyone else is. So he pretty much just has to find a whole new lineup. And this is where we get into coming up with the lineup. And the lineup that pretty much would be for the Court as a Power record would actually would be uh, Tommy Iyer, who would be the keyboardist, Neil Murray, who at the same time is still working with White Snake, and of course, same goes for Ian Pace, who of course is still working with White Snake. Again, Ian Pace though is best known for also Deep Purple, because he was one of the founding members of Deep Purple. So at least he's got a member. He's and of course Gary Moore decided to take over pretty much mostly the lead vocals, and uh, and so on. So he's pretty much the sole vocal instead of having someone else sing. He's got himself singing this time again. Uh, but also, for at least one or two songs, actually for one song, he would get probably uh, Shunar. That'd be for uh, End of the World. And then, of course, um, Mo Foster and Don Airy, of course, comes back. I guess he was able to still still kind of squeeze in Don Airy a bit there for at least track number five. And that would be Falling in Love with You. But that would be the only time and then the last time that he would uh, you know, work with uh, Don Airy and Media Pipe. Who knows? We'll get into uh, at some point, maybe maybe by, by a year or so later, I'll get into Victim of the Future. So also on alongside uh, that too, he's got Jack Bruce providing co-lead vocals to, of course, End of the World. Again, Jack Bruce, Cream, um, Wes Bruce and Lang, and uh, Robin Trower, all sorts, sorts of great artists there. So Great, uh, great pick though, and also probably the heaviest thing Jack Bruce has ever recorded on. So we're finally gonna be adding a heading into Corridors of Power, and of course he's got Jeff Glixman as the producer, who also, uh, at least prior to this, was best known for producing the Paul Stanley solo record of those four Kiss solo records, and of course by a year later he would also work with Saxon on the Power and the Glory record. There you go. So that's pretty much it. So now this album with this lineup and the producer, this obviously was recorded at the Townhouse Studios and of course also at Air Studios in London, UK from at least March to May of 1982 and eventually through both Virgin and Mirage, actually Virgin in both the European markets and in Canada. And I'll get into that, which of course it would have its own different artwork, uh, which... I think by now I'll kind of show you the art for at least uh, the Corridors of Power album. I'll kind of show you the, this artwork, which again uh, is much more different. You're kind of you've been seeing the original artwork, which uh, still have I've yet to transition. I have yet to transition into the uh, uh, the alternate artwork that was used for most of the U.S. and Canadian markets. Uh, the European market cover, of course, featured pre-print features. Uh, Gary Moore in what pretty much is a corridor, corridors of power, you know. <laughs> Whereas now you're fi finally I'm going to transition into the uh, the American and Canadian cover for corridors of power. This cover art actually ends up featuring Gary Moore, which seems to be a live shot of him and with at least what pinkish and purplish uh, lighting with smoke. And of course, uh, what would feature the more stylized Gary Moore logo, which is why I kind of, I actually prefer this cover art over the European one because, again, it also uses the more stylized Gary Moore uh, logo instead of over some generic uh, type font. You know, it at least looks more cooler. I mean, of course, I've done a concoct version where I used uh, the Gary Moore logo over the uh, the uh, 
generic type font that was used for the European one. I get it, and I'll get into the, the stylings for Corridors of Power. But eventually, uh, it, it's just released. So here we go, we're finally into Corridors of Power, and compared to the previous two albums, and maybe maybe in a little bit compared to the, the G-Force material, since he might be playing off a little bit of the influence of the G-Force material, the more popular kind of very AOR-ish uh, styling leanings of the G-Force record, but um, he's still kind of playing a little bit of the heaviness of some of the earlier stuff, especially, I mean, uh, in comparison to like Dirty Fingered, which is more of a heavier, more rock and record from start to finish. This one, he's kind of playing around. This is definitely, it, there is still plenty of rockers on the sound, but he's definitely leaning into more of a more melodic, more AOR, hard rock kind of direction in a way. It's definitely more, more uh, especially the uh, due to the ballads on some of the, on this album. And it's just more different. And again, there's still some great rockers on here. It's just that in comparison to Dirty Fingers and Back on the Streets, it's just a, you, you really can hear that he's really kind of heading into more of a direction that actually would be seen as more of appeal to the American market than really the European market. Whereas like with like Dirty Fingers and Back on the Streets did, you know, where they kind of appealed to the more European market, especially at times with the new wave of British heavy metal crowd. Whereas this one, not so much. This one definitely you really can hear that the... Um, him wanting to go in again that AOR direction, the more melodic hard rock stuff. I know this at times gets classified as heavy metal, and there's at least at least two songs on the sound that I can classify as metal. But for the most part, this is definitely more of a melodic hard rock album, and that's really definitely heard in songs like "Always Gonna Love You," "Gonna Break My Heart Again," "Falling in Love with You," and. I guess you can say maybe cold hearted and don't take me for a loser. And of course, uh, I can't wait until tomorrow, which I can't wait until tomorrow is a seven, uh, seven minute and 47 second, uh, very melodic and slow blues number. And it's actually a good song. I like it though. I can't really say it's my favorite song on the album, but it's a, a song that I actually like. Uh, but Besides the already the more melodic songs, uh, I would say the ones I just gravitate towards more is obviously the more rockers. Now, I could probably can read the track listing a bit here so I can keep it going. Again, that be like, you know, Don't Take Me For A Loser, uh, Always Gonna Love You, a cover of Freeze Wishing Well, Gonna Break My Heart Again, again, uh, I, that I uh, mentioned, Falling In Love With You, End Of The World, Rockin' Every Night, Cold hearted, and of course, I can't wait until tomorrow. And of course, the time length for the sound is at least 43 minutes and 10 seconds. So, there you go. But again, just to kind of keep on track, the melodic songs are fine. Uh, I would say, of at least the more AOR ish kind of melodic rock songs on the album, I think the one that I like the most is going to break my heart again. That's the only one I actually like. But I'm not going to choose, you know going to choose to listen to it on my free time when I'm browsing on the internet. Same thing for, let's say, songs like Always Gonna Love You and Falling In Love With You. I'm not going to actively going to listen to these songs when I'm browsing on the internet. Or let's say, uh, if I'm, let's say, in the car listening to my Google Pixel uh, phone. Because I actually got, I got the sound on my Google Pixel. Is a set, if I've got songs on shuffle and let's say any of these two songs pop up even to it's maybe gonna break my heart again i'm gonna skip them i'm gonna skip these songs i'll I, I can i can hang with i can't wait until tomorrow i can hang with that track but still it's a fine song it's good but i'm not I still i'm gonna be in the mood for the other ones that's gonna be like don't take me for a loser uh, the cover of Wishing Well, End of the World, Rockin' Every Night, and Cold Hearted. I'm actually gonna, gonna uh, stick with these songs, and when they pop up, I'll I'll let these songs play out, because I really enjoy these ones. Now, if I'm listening to the album, um, let's say on my, you know, since I got this on CD, and if I'm listening to my CD player, I'll let the whole album play. I'm not gonna skip a song, but I'll let them play out, because I do dig some of these songs. Is a sat. 
I'm probably going to skip them on another format. You know, I won't actually go out and listen to these. But again, I love songs like Don't Take Me For A Loser, which is definitely of the more straight up hard rockers that has that sort of melodic AOR edge. This is probably one of my favorites on the album, and it's a good way to open up the record. Uh, same thing goes for like Cold Hearted. Now, this one's definitely more of a slower, more mid-paced kind of number. It's definitely more bluesier, but it's a lot more harder edged compared to, let's say, what would come after, what would, you know, end the record, that being I can't wait until tomorrow. So it's fine, but it's a good song, nonetheless, and I actually like it. Uh, Rockin' Every Night and End of the World are two of the absolute songs that comes close to being heavy metal on the record. These are definitely two of the heavier songs. Uh, Rockin' Every Night is definitely more of a fast one. It's actually a little bit more similar to, um, what is it? Uh, really Gonna Rock Tonight off of Dirty Fingers. Since he probably didn't really get to release uh, Dirty Fingers officially in 1980, I think he wanted to take another crack at the more sort of very faster, more harder edged hard rock styling so i think he pretty much continued that with rocking every night and uh, it's very much similar to again um to uh gonna, really gonna rock tonight it's very similar and uh, i think i kind of like really gonna rock tonight off of dirty fingers even though it's such a generic uh, song title but again it's a fun song to listen to i love it i might put really gonna rock tonight over um rocking every night I know, they're both so generic titled. But again, they're fun songs. They're badass. I like them. However, my absolute personal favorite off the of Quarters of Power is End of the World. God damn it, this is my absolute per personal favorite. And this is a song that is the reason for why I ended up uh, having any sort of um, uh, inspiration to want to go and search out a copy of Corridors of Power was just based off this song alone. The first time I heard End of the World was on the Rocket Cotton Steel compilation record, which again was one that was released in Scandinavia, which again I own. The only reason I bought that record was because of that one heavy load song that was a, recorded for the Stronger Than Evil record, but was not added on that album. Of course, now it's made as a bonus track for like what the... Uh, Ah, oh, shit. Uh, the Nori Morse uh, records reissues for uh, Stronger Than Evil. But, god damn. I mean, besides other bands on there like Gillen and uh, Warrior and 220 Volt and Man of War, which also, those are really good too. Those are good songs on there as well. But it's just those. The two Gary Moore songs were my absolute favorite on that record by, by far, in a way. Just uh, End of the World and Murders in the Sky, which Murders in the Sky was off of the album that comes uh, burp there. After Quarters of Power, that being Victims of the Future, but goddamn, these are uh, two great songs. Now, End of the World is one that uh, is the only song on the album that features Bobby Schuenard, who would later would go on and do stuff with Alice Cooper for like the trash record, and I believe maybe Hey Stupid, but I could be wrong on that one, so you could end up fact checking me on that in the comments section below. But he did work with Alice Cooper for the trash record, uh, which again, one of the first. Uh, albums I bought uh, physically on CD in the early days of my childhood. When Raspin, it was known as Tower Records here in Fresno. But, and of course, it's the only song that where Jack Bruce uh, does co-lead vocals on. And at the time, I could not even tell that this was Jack Bruce. I mean, I had listened to the West Bruce and Lang record and, of course, uh, BLT, you know, the Robin Trial record that he did with um, Jack Bruce. It's a fucking great record. I actually think that's a really good record, but I couldn't I couldn't believe that this was Jack Bruce at times. I mean, now to find out that that was, it's like, oh my god, because this is the heaviest song I think Jack Bruce has ever uh, uh, you know played on. Such a heavy track. I mean, he's not performing the bass on it, but god dang, I mean, it's mo, it's um, Neo Mori. And oh, god dang, uh, it's a it's a damn good heavy song. I mean, it starts out very uh, sh you know flashy, very neoclassical, and you also think it's gonna go into like a power metal kind of song. Something you uh, would think would be on like the shrapnel label in a way. Kind of plays like that. It's fucking great shredding guitar playing. Shows how great uh, Gary Moore was. But as it goes in the actual song, it's a heavy number, and I love it. Kind of bluesy. But goddamn, it's such a heavy song. I love it from beginning to end. And Jack Bruce, 
at times, he almost blends in with Gary Moore's voice because they almost sound alike. It's just unbelievably how they blend together their voices. They sound so similar, even though I had listened to uh, Jack Bruce's stuff more than I'd ever heard Gary Moore's stuff in my entire life, but I could not uh, get over the fact that this is Jack Bruce also singing some of this song, and he actually sings some of the opening lines on it. But during the chorus part, it's definitely Gary Moore because he's definitely more of a higher re register in his voice, and he actually can you know, does some of those falsettos, whereas Jack Bruce can't. Obviously, maybe because of age, and it probably would sound weird from him since it's the set. It's the guy that, you know, did Cream and that stuff with uh, Eric Clapton. So it's just crazy that this stuff he's done with, like, Leslie West and then, of course, you know, Eric Clapton. And then he's doing this stuff with Gary Moore, and it's, like, more metal. And I was like, fuck, what a, a crazy uh, a coincidence here. But goddamn, I love this song from beginning to end. And it's a song where that basically made me want to go on and search out a copy of Coros of Power. What a fucking good song this is. And so it really is my absolute favorite on the entire record with probably Don't Take Me For A Loser and Cold Hearted and Rockin' Every Night Pond being my other favorites. In that row, that's the way I would place them. But god dang it, one of my absolute favorite songs. Uh, but he would continue this uh, style leaning with, of course, with Murders in, in the Sky, which is, I don't know, at, when I first was listening to that song, I mean, I, I probably should save my comments, though. I probably should save my comments for whenever I do uh, Murders in, I mean, uh, Victims of the Future, you know. I should. But uh, it is, it, it's just a really good uh, song, nonetheless. There we go. So, in a way... Quarters of Power, when I finally first was able to get a hold of this copy and when I was finally able to listen to it, I do say after going from Dirty Fingers, this kind of was a, or was before Dirty Fingers, it was a little bit weird to me because it's got, it opens up good to me. It opens up good with Don't Take Me For A Loser, but then we get into like Always Gonna Love You. Then it's like, okay, where are we fucking going now? Now we're going to like ballad, very AOR ballad territory. And so it just felt odd to me. So, but when we do go into Wishing Well, it's a good cover, actually. It's a good cover. It really is good. Uh, though, it just seemed kind of weird. It's like, okay, even though it's pretty good, where it's, I actually take it over Always Gonna Love You just when I'm actually listening to it because it's like, all right, I guess we're getting back on track, but then we get into Gonna Break My Heart Again. It's like, all right, we're kind of keeping it more... It's more lighter, more more upbeat, and this is very much radio-friendly in a way. This is all meant to be, and it's fine. As an AOR rocker, it's good, but in comparison to some of the other ones that's gonna come after, especially like Falling In Love With You because of... To me, this, and I kind of feel like this is probably the weakest of the album. It's like the, the this first half is like the weakest part of the album because of it actually has got one really good track, one pretty good cover, and just some that are just kind of, they're, they're either good to just kind of a little bit middle of the road. It's kind of meh in some ways to me, even though I can hang with it when I'm listening to the record, but it's just kind of eh. Fine, by the time we get into the second half, it's like now we're back on track. Now we're getting to, to, to what I was expecting from this record and then what I really got. And we were Enter the World, Rockin' Every Night, and Cold Hearted. And so, three just smoking songs from beginning to end. Smoking songs. Then, of course, we get into I Can't Wait Until Tomorrow. And at first, I didn't know what to think, but the more I got into it, the more it sunk into me. The more I'm like, you know what? This is a really fine, slow, melodic blues number and got a nice, good emotion to it. That's the one thing I can give Gary Moore. He always found a way to come up with at least nice, somber numbers that you can feel the emotion coming from him. Like he actually believes every word he says, every note he plays, he, he believes in. And it just comes across, at least at times, pretty authentic. Because he feels that like uh, this in a way. It's such, such a very moody song. And I think it's a fine way to end the album. It's just that the second half is the best for me. Whereas the first half just kind of jumbles around a bit. It's a little bit herky-jerky. And I don't know if I care much for this half of the record. I mean, it's got one fucking good you know, opening song in a way. And I think it is a good opening song. But it just goes from there. It's like, all right, this kind of goes a little bit kind of off the track a bit for me. It kind of just get it. The, the, the train tracks are to get a little shaky. So that's where I'm at. It's a good record, though, from beginning to end. 
but I don't know if I can say this is actually my favorite one. That's why I actually would say that Dirty Fingers is a much more stronger album than uh, Corridors of Power. Now, I'm going to save my opinions for Victims of the Future until next year. So that's why I'm going to leave things at. Goods record. The bonus tracks though for this one, I at times feel like throwaway. They're like throwaway songs in a way. It's like they're almost kind of like ones that only a completist is going to have. But just as for listening to throwaway. And I think it's just that you can just toss those the, the bonus tracks out the fucking window. And hope that they end up in a burning garbage can. So let, let, let that off. Ah. Uh, so that's it. After this one, I mean, it's, this didn't do, domestically didn't do completely great, but it did do fine. And it actually, I think, kind of reintroduced the world to this new style, leaning of Gary Moore, this new version of Gary Moore. And that leads into Vixen of the Future. There we go. Huh. So, since I've gone on for this long, and I think this was going to be uh, usual anyways for this one, I hope all of you enjoyed it. Again, if anybody has ever listened to Corridors of Power that ever owned this record, or the, or who at least owns uh, any of the two copies, and you've spent years listening to this one, and you maybe, who knows, maybe you might have just been uh, getting into this record now, just like me. If you have any sort of comments about this record, whether it be positive or negative, you can leave them in the comments section below. But with that, hope all of you enjoyed, and that's it. This is Every Thresher saying I'm out, and I'll see you all later. Take care, everyone.